Blessed be our God. Forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we beseech thee graciously to behold this thy family, for which our Lord Jesus Christ was contented to be betrayed and given up into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross. For now liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, ever one God, the world without end. Amen. reading from the book of Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see, and that which they have not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, and as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And are so far from my cry and from the words of my distress. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer. By night as well, but I find no rest. 
from the letter to the Hebrews. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. At that time, Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged, and the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to the Judeans, Look, 
I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw Jesus, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Judeans answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release Jesus, but the Judeans cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. Pilate said to the Judeans, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but the emperor. Then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written, and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Judeans read this inscription, because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priest said to Pilate, Do not write, the King of the Jews, but... This man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says, They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother, and the disciple whom he loved standing by her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit.
Since it was the day of preparation, the Judeans did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified, so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred, so that the scripture might be fulfilled, none of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. On Sunday, in Mark's version of the Passion, we read that the soldiers compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry Jesus' cross. It's a familiar moment in the story. Ordinarily, those condemned to be crucified were forced to carry their own crosses from the place of judgment to the place of crucifixion. In one sense, it made the whole process even more cruel than it already was. But in another sense, it may have been a small mercy. Crucifixion is a slow way to die. But by forcing the condemned to carry their crosses through the streets of Jerusalem to the other side of town, the soldiers actually weakened their victims, thus helping to hasten death once they were actually hanging on the cross. Jesus, however, was already barely able to stand. He needed help just to get to Golgotha, and the soldiers had no compunction about grabbing the first person they saw and forcing him to carry the cross for Jesus. We might be inclined to see this in light of Jesus' familiar exhortation, any who would be my followers must take up their cross and follow me. But that is not actually what is happening here. Simon is not taking up his own cross. He's taking up the cross of Jesus. And I would suggest that there is a great difference between those two things. One of the great, though not widely known, spiritual writers of the 20th century was a man named Charles Williams. He was a member of that select group of Oxford Christians known as the Inklings, who included C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, among others. In fact, until his untimely death in 1945, Williams was in many ways the central figure of the group. And among his most compelling writings are a series of seven books, which are best described, I think, as metaphysical thrillers. To be sure, they are not for everyone, but I'd like to tell you about one of them, a novel entitled Descent into Hell. The plot of this novel involves a young woman called Pauline and an ancestor of hers named John Struther. In the novel, John Struther is one of the Protestant martyrs in the reign of Mary Tudor. Though separated from her ancestor by some 400 years, Pauline encounters him in another dimension of time. Now remember, it's a novel, not a true story, so the ordinary rules of time and space can be suspended by the writer. In the pivotal scene in the novel, John is in his prison cell awaiting his execution. As a heretic, he is to be burned at the stake, and he's in deep fear and anguish over the terrible ordeal he is to face. In his anguish, his body convulses and he cries out to God, Pauline views this scene and says to him, can I help you? John does not see her, he only hears the voice, and he assumes that it is God speaking to him. He says, 
Lord God, I cannot bear the fear of the fire. The author writes, Pauline knew what to do. She was offered, in a most certain fact, through four centuries, her place at the table of exchange. She knew what she must do, but she felt, as she stood, that she could no more do it than he. She could never bear that fear, the knowledge of being burnt alive, of the flames, of the faces, of the prolongation of pain. She knew what she must do. She opened her mouth, but could not speak. Finally, her voice said, Give it to me, John Struther. He heard it in his cell and chains as the first dawn of the day of his martyrdom broke beyond the prison. It spoke and sprang in his drained heart and drove the riotous blood again through his veins. Give it to me, John Struther. He stretched out his arms again. He cried, Lord, Lord. It was a devotion and an adoration. It accepted and thanked. He fell on his knees, and in a great roar of triumph, he called out, I have seen the salvation of my God. John Struther went joyfully to the stake, and when the flames got hold of him, he cried, I have seen the salvation of my God, and so many times till he died. We may look at this story from two different perspectives. On the one hand, there's the fictional martyr, John Struther. His time and his condition are far removed from our experience and probably far more extreme than anything we are likely ever to have to face. Nevertheless, though his immediate condition may seem more extreme, his general condition is precisely like ours. We experience all kinds of anxieties and fears in our lives. Some are of our own making, due to our own foibles and our sins. Others come upon us from the outside, like this past year of isolation and anxiety due to the pandemic. Sometimes, even our faith in God is assailed by doubts. What is more, the truth is that we are completely unable to do anything about the essential brokenness of which all of these outward fears and anxieties are only the symptoms. We need someone else to act for us, someone else to help us bear our infirmities, our fears, and our doubts. And we have a Savior who does just that. Come unto me, he says, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. He invites us to give all our pain and fear and doubt to him in a great exchange in which all that burden is lifted from us so that we may see the salvation of our God. He stretches out his arms of love on the cross in order to embrace us. Even as he dies on the cross, he welcomes us into a place of safety within his embrace. But there's another perspective on this story, Pauline's perspective. At first, hesitantly, but then with determination, Pauline takes seriously St. Paul's admonition to bear one another's burdens. One might say that Pauline is the Christ figure in this story as she offers to take on the burden of her ancestor's agony. Or, yet again, one might say that John Struther is the Christ figure and Pauline represents Simon of Cyrene. To look at the novel and, more importantly, the gospel in this way, suggests to me a more profound mystery. Is it possible that Simon's role was something more than merely carrying a cross? Is it possible that Simon was called not only to carry the cross, but somehow also 
to carry some of the burden of pain and fear and perhaps even doubt for Jesus. You know, it's remarkable that the church remembers Simon by name. He's a bit player in this great drama, but the church remembers not only his name, but the names of his sons, Alexander and Rufus. I think that such a memory is more than just a bit of local color. It confirms in my mind that we are to take Simon's role in the story very seriously. To be sure, he did not volunteer for the job he was given. He had no choice. But how often do we find ourselves in the position of being drafted into service where we had not intended to go? And in such situations, the important thing is not why or how we were given the responsibility, but the fact that we accepted the role we were given to bear one another's burdens, to participate in the exchange which makes a difference in the life of someone else, literally to save someone in need. Consider the deeper meaning of Simon's role here. Without Simon's help, Jesus had little hope of completing the physical challenge just of getting to Calvary. But the heavy load which Jesus carried that day was far more than the heavy wood of the cross. It was more even than the mental anguish and spiritual desolation of a man who already felt abandoned by his friends and perhaps even God. For in these last hours of his incarnate life, Jesus bore the full weight of human failure, not his, but ours, the incredible burden of sin which shattered our relationship with God. Is it too far-fetched to think that Simon shared some of that burden as well? I often make reference to a prayer of which I'm very fond, a prayer which I say when I mix the water into the wine in the communion chalice. It says, O God, who didst wonderfully create and yet more wonderfully restore the dignity of human nature, grant that we may share the divine life of him who humbled himself to share our humanity. What does it mean to share the divine life? If he shares our humanity to the full, then sharing the divine life must mean sharing it to the full. Certainly it means sharing the glory but the glory of God is the cross, not just the crosses we are called up to take up if we wish to be his followers, but his cross. Thus, having put on Christ, we are to carry not only one another's burdens, but his. In a sense, this is the greater mystery of our faith. You and I are called to be partners with God in the redemption of the world. We're called not only to cooperate in our own salvation, we are called to share with God the burden of his redeeming work for all humanity. It is indeed a remarkable exchange in which God invites and accepts our help. It is absurd and beyond any reasonable possibility of ordinary comprehension, but then that God could love us hopeless sinners at all, that God could become a man, that God could die on a cross. That is all absurd and true. We believe all this and more. We believe that we share in his life precisely because we share in his death. And so today we take up his cross and move through the streets of Jerusalem to the place of his death and ours. Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent His Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. 
that all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity and witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers and the people whom they serve, for all the people of this diocese and for all Christians in this community, that God will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Let us kneel in silent prayer. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth, and for those in authority among them. For Joseph, the President of the United States, for the Congress and the Supreme Court, for the members and representatives of the United Nations, for all who serve the common good, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Let us kneel in silent prayer. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace, and guide with thy wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility thy dominion may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of thy love, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for the hungry and the homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, for the sick, the wounded and the crippled, for those in loneliness, fear and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives and those in mortal danger, that God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Let us kneel in silent prayer.
Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, let the cry of those in misery and need come to thee, that they may find thy mercy present with them in all their afflictions. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who have not received the gospel of Christ, for those who have never heard the word of salvation, for those who have lost their faith, for those pardoned by sin or indifference, for the contemptuous and the scornful, for those who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples, for those who in the name of Christ have persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Let us kneel in silent prayer. Merciful God, creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know thee as thou art revealed in thy Son, Jesus Christ. Let thy gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it, and bring home to thy fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us commit ourselves to our God and pray for the grace of a holy life, that with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ, and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. Let us kneel in silent prayer. changeable power and eternal light. Look favorably on thy whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of thy providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. That the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made. Thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.
We glory in your cross, O Lord, and praise and glorify your holy resurrection, for by virtue of your cross, joy has come to the whole world. May God be merciful to us and bless us, show us the light of his countenance and come to us. Let your ways be known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God, let all the peoples praise you. We glory in your cross, O Lord, and praise and glorify your holy resurrection. For by virtue of your cross, joy has come to the whole world. Our Father, who art Lord in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will, will be done, on earth, earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead, to thy holy church peace and concord, and to us sinners everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, thou livest and reignest one God, now and forever.